appreciate his word and everything he's got to say for us here tonight. John chapter 2 is where we're going to start out tonight. So go ahead and get your Bibles there and get them opened. And um, <clears throat> I went ahead and, and made some notes uh, concerning something I mentioned last Wednesday night. Uh, and, that, and that has been the issue of the word wine in the Bible. And there are those who say that, uh, that Jesus did make um, alcoholic wine, wine with alcohol in it. Uh, there, are those, there are even those who say he probably partook of wine with alcohol in it. I have huge objections to that. Um, and they say, well, the word wine is the word wine. The word wine means wine. You know, there are people that drink wine. Wine has alcohol in it. Not necessarily. You have to know, the, you have to know English first. Not Greek and Hebrew. You got to start out with English first. Know where we got the word wine from. And, um, and I've had, it's just over the years of the ministry, I've had people ask me questions. I remember there was a guy, when we were out at, at the church in Richwoods, Missouri, it's a little country church, and um, there was a, a young man in the church, uh, his family had, had grown up in the church, and he had gotten away from the Lord at several times in his life, and he had come back. And I remember one time him and his wife, uh, it was really great because um, while we were leading, while we were singing the songs before the message, they got in a conviction and came down to the altar. And man, it was a service. We just had a good time praying with them. But they were just confessing sins and one thing, another. And before too long, he started bringing up the issue of drinking again. What he did was he would have a conversation with his mom and dad who did not drink. They were members of the church. Then he would have conversations with his lost brother. He had an older brother that was lost, not going to church. And what he was, and he brought it up in Sunday school t one time. And what he said was, doesn't the Bible teach that it's okay what you do as long as you do it in moderation? And I went, no, no, it doesn't. And um, I talked to his mom one day and, and she told me about the conversation he had had with his older brother. And I said, let me tell you what I think that is. I think he is bouncing it off people, waiting for somebody to tell him it's okay for him to go back to drinking again. He's just looking for a reason. He's looking for someone to tell him that it's okay. And I said, he'll, he'll keep doing it until he finds it. Well, it went from once, once the alcohol came back into his life and, and we, Lisa and I had already left that church and come back to Bethel. Um, I was talking to one of the deacons down there about this particular man. I asked about him. He said, hey, he's, he's selling meth. He's cooking and selling meth. And he, you know, Richwoods is a very poor area, Washington County. There's not a lot of factories down there, not a lot of places to work. And he justified it by saying, you know, I could cut wood all day long and sell firewood to people and barely get by, if anything, or I could sell meth and make a lot of money. And then he got his kids taken away, naturally. And uh, then his wife left. And I mean, it just it just spiraled downhill from there. But the alcohol was the was the doorway that he went back through to get to these other things that were awaiting him on the other side of that. And um, so anyway, there, people's people will read into the Bible what they want it to say. They will say, well, God said it sort of like this, or doesn't the Bible say this? You can do this as long as it's in moderation. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with having a drink at the end of the day. It helps relax me. And I'm going, so does a hot shower. Okay, but you won't get out of the shower and beat your wife up afterwards. All right. 
So anyway, we'll, we, I, we might get into that tonight, but we're going to talk about the water. We mentioned that last Wednesday night, that he turned to wine. And what is the, what was the nature of that? What did that mean? John chapter two, uh, verse one, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage and they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus, and I, I actually think the two or three number there means, I think it belongs there. I think it points out eventually where we're headed with this. Um, the Bible doesn't give you the exact number of eunuchs that threw Jezebel out the window. But it does say it was two or three of them. Okay? Now, why, why would it say it that way? Can you think of something else in the Bible that's two or three? Witnesses. Okay? There's a reason for everything in the Bible. Two or three, all right? So, um, verse uh, 7, Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. The, this beginning of miracles Jesus did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Father, we ask for uh, you to come and visit with us this evening. For God, for you to speak to each and every one, Lord, that is willing to listen, willing to hear, willing to have their minds and their hearts opened up. I pray, dear God, that you would give us profound wisdom, the wisdom that this world cannot teach because it cannot understand it. It does not have it. Only your word has this kind of wisdom. Show us great and mighty things which we know not. Know not. And Father, we have now entered into a new phase in our country. We do not know what the future holds. But Father, we know that we must stand strong. We must stand together. We must not let what the enemy is doing to fill us full of fear, to divide us against one another. But Father, just to stand against the wiles of the devil that is taking place in this country. We ask for your grace. We ask for your help. We thank you for your word, the lamp that lights our feet and shines the light that we need to go on on our path in this very dark winter that we're going through right now. Bless all of those, Father, who are still sick, could not be with us. We pray, dear God, that you would visit with them and give them healing. And Father, we look forward to the day when they can come back into your house. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. What? So we, we examined the issue of the water last Wednesday night. Changing the water to wine. What does wine represent in the Bible? What does it represent in the scriptures? What does it mean when wine is used as a symbol? Anybody know? The Holy Spirit. The wine of the Holy Spirit. All right. So let's go through the Bible and find out what the Bible says about that. Judges 9, 13. And, and again, this is, this is one of those verses here. Judges 9, 13. The very first verse we're going to talk about tonight. You have to use, number one, the context of the whole Bible. 
you have to use the context of where the verse is, who's speaking it, what's being spoken of, and so on. Because when you read this verse, you might get the idea that our God in heaven has a case of muscatel next to him. Sitting there drinking it. Okay? Judges 9.13. And th this is a parable that's being told. I'm not going to get into the whole parable tonight. But he said, And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Now again, if the word wine in our Bibles only means alcohol laced grape juice corrupted by leaven grape juice where it has an alcohol content to it then we look at this verse and say God uses wine as a pick-me-up God drinks the juice so he can get happy and there by the way there are different types of drunks there's some when they start drinking they get happy Overly happy, obnoxiously happy. There are some who are lovers when they get drunk. I love you, man. Okay, you're my buddy. Not only that, they love 90% of the women in that bar. And then with others, I heard it put this way, there's a boxing glove in every bottle. Wine just makes them want to fight, okay? So when you read this verse here, Judges 9, 13, should I leave my wine which cheereth God and man? Does this work? Can you imagine any scenario at all where you would think God is sitting up in heaven with a big goblet of Mogan David wine sucking it down to get happy? Absolutely not. So it can't mean that always. It cannot mean that always. Okay? Grape juice is a very unique juice in the Bible. It does have medicinal properties. Years ago, uh, my wife, uh, after she had had Lindsay, Alicia, and Courtney, and she was working a full-time job, and she was drained, and her doctor said, you're very low on iron. And so she said, well, should I get some iron supplements? And he said, yes, but I will tell you that a great source of iron is in grape juice or wine. Take your pick. But it is a tremendous source of iron in it. And that's what she did for a while. She drank grape juice and restored that iron back to it because she was depleted. It was, it was gone out of her. Okay. So there's no doubt about it. Wine itself, unfermented, uncorrupted, is a very wonderful drink. There's nothing like it in the world. Okay? So think about it like this. Uncorrupted wine, non-alcoholic wine, will represent the joy that God's Spirit will give you when God's Spirit decides to give you joy, give you happiness in your life, He'll give it to you. And all of a sudden, you'll just get Holy Ghost happy. Somebody say amen. Wine, if, if you think of it as the, the oncoming of the Holy Spirit in your life, God will give you a joy that you just cannot get. You won't be able to get it from the knock me out John stuff. You won't be able to get that kind of joy from there because that joy doesn't last. God's joy lasts forever. Amen. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Turn there. And turn to these verses. Mark them in your Bible. Learn this. I, I was going to mention earlier. To me, it's sad that with some people, the very first taste of alcohol that they ever got was in a church. Because Catholic churches, Lutheran churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, probably others, 
will use fermented wine in their communion service. And they do it every Sunday. They have a communion service every Sunday with Catholics. It's the Mass. And their first taste of alcohol, they got it at church. Okay? That, I, I grew up here. We never, ever used fermented wine in this church. Ever. And it's, as far as I got anything to say about it, we never will. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy... Sub By the way, you, the marrow of your bones, what does it produce? What kind? White ones. The marrow in your bones produces white blood cells. White blood cells are what keeps you healthy. They are what fights bacteria, viruses, germs, any kind of uncleanness in the body. White blood cells do it that way. That's what marrow is good for. It should be health to thy navel, marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with what? He uses the phrase new wine here. Now, I'm not going to tell you that every time the Bible means unfermented wine, it's going to tell you it's new wine. Obviously, that's not the case in Judges 9.13. So again, you have to use what you know about God, what you know God would and would not do. And I'm, that, last week I mentioned that controversy that was in the denomination that we came out of. Started in the Bible college. They, they had it set up. They were going to set up this professor to get him to say in a classroom that he believed that it was possible that Jesus had made fermented wine. And they took that and ran with it and made, you know, charges against him. And as far as the denomination was concerned, they wanted him thrown out. And when they didn't throw him out, then they said, fine, we'll start our own Bible college. And I'll tell you that, that Bible college wasn't any better than the, than the one that they all left. Okay, that was one of those, John, that was one of those Bible colleges that they were very strict. They had rules on how long a man's hair could be, rules on how long a young lady's dress could be, rules about dating and courting in, you know, in college, things like that, things they could and could not do. But when it came to the King James Bible, they didn't believe it. They used it. They didn't believe it was inspired. They didn't believe it was inerrant. And the professor of Greek of that Bible college that started as a result of this issue was my first pastor here at this church. Yep. And he's the one that came up with this idea that said the blood of Jesus doesn't actually do anything. It's the death of Jesus that saves men. The blood is no different than any other part of Jesus' earthly body. It cannot atone for your sins. It's a metonym. And I went, he, that man will never preach here ever again. Won't happen. But he said, honor the Lord with thy substance, verse 9, and with the first fruits, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now remember, we... Let's, let's just, for the sake of argument, say that wine, new wine, represents the Holy Spirit. It is a symbol for the Holy Spirit, okay? So think about what this is saying. If you honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of all thine increase. Let me give everybody a piece of really good advice. Something that... God showed Lisa and I years ago. He's shown it to many other people. It's actually in the scriptures. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If there was a, if there was a, um, a female cow, she had never calved before and she gave birth to her first calf, that first calf belonged to the Lord. 
The first one did. Not the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. The first one belonged to the Lord. Firstborn son always belonged to the Lord. The first fruits of the harvest was what they were told to tithe on. Not the last, not the leftovers. The first press of olive oil. You know, there's types of olive oil. There's extra virgin olive oil. That's the first press. The second press, the olive oil comes out, but it's not as, not as clear. It's not as, doesn't have that rich, deep flavor and rich, deep color. He's telling you here that when you get ready to give to God, put that at the top of your list, not the bottom of your list. So many people, and you don't hear me talk about this much, so many people, when it comes to giving, put God at the bottom and say, if there's anything left over, we'll give it to God. Okay? Now, that's between you and the Lord. If you want to do it that way, that's between you and the Lord. What I'm telling you is, by both experience and by Scripture, that if you give God first he'll bless you now don't give to god first to get a blessing you've already got all the blessings you could ever want okay but give to god first and watch and see what happens okay and your your presses shall burst out with new wine Picture both of, I believe, the Holy Ghost and, of course, the Scriptures. Isaiah 65, 8. Here it is. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. So now there's, there's no disputing here. The new wine comes directly, is that grape juice that's pressed from the grapes right out of the cluster. Kids, kids, you ain't never had fun until your daddy tells you to take your shoes and socks off and get inside of a great big barrel and have you stomping grapes. There's more fun in that than anything I can remember doing in childhood. My daddy was going to make wine. And he bought a big old barrel, had it cut in half, put wax, he waxed it so it wouldn't leak. I remember, I remember watching him do all this. He filled it full of grapes and he called me and my sister down. He said, take shoes and socks off and get in there and just stomp away. That was fun. New wine is found in the cluster. And we actually have a, a story of this. The butler that gave wine to Pharaoh in Joseph's day, the Bible says that he squeezed it right out of the grape into his glass. New wine. New wine. So do not make the mistake of believing that every time you see the word wine in the Bible, well, it must mean fermented wine. It doesn't. It doesn't. Again, the whole context of the Bible counts. The whole context of what you know about God counts. The context of the story counts. There's a lot of things that go into that. All right. Jo now turn to Joel chapter three. Let's see. Yeah. Joel chapter three. In fact, yeah. In fact, turn to Joel. Let's look at some things for a minute. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Joel chapter 1. So let's, let's say it like this. New wine represents the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Because it's not been corrupted and defiled with leaven. Leaven is always a picture of sin in the Bible. Picture of corruption. Okay, so let's say that new wine represents the Holy Ghost. And then we'll say, so what would fermented wine represent? 
Just take a guess. If new wine represents the Holy Spirit, fermented wine would represent the unholy spirit. Okay, but, but spirits. Because both of them, the Holy Spirit and unclean spirits, are going to have an effect on your mind. Both of them. In the case of new wine, it's a positive effect. It's a good effect. Okay, tastes good, puts you in a good mood. It's very refreshing as a beverage. Um, after, since COVID, I don't drink soda pop anymore. I just, I just don't like it. I just don't like soda pop anymore. So I've gone back to drinking tea. And at the gas station we stop at every morning, I get my 44-ounce cup, put a little ice in it. And I fill it mostly with unsweet tea. And then they've got next to it, they've got some raspberry tea. And then they've got what's called sangria tea, but it's not, it's not fermented. It's just grape juice flavored tea. And so I put about that much in my cup because I like the taste of it. I don't want all that sugar, but I like the taste of it. It's pretty good. So think about what he's, think about the difference here. New wine represents the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost affects the way you think, the way you see, the way you visualize this world. While you have, there, there are a lot of people today who are cheering the inauguration of a very senile president who's not going to last four years. Not a chance. You have a lot of people who are cheering that on. But what kind of people? The dope heads, the drunkards, the fornicators, the child molesters, the corruptors, the Marxist, all, all of that ilk. Those are the ones who are celebrating the fact that Trump's now gone and they want him to stay gone. He's not out of danger. They'll try to kill him because he'll run again. I guarantee you he'll run again. Look, notice what it, you're in Joel. I want you to notice what Joel chapter one, verse four says that which the palmer worm have left at the locust eaten. You got a palmer worm, you got a locust. Then we have then what the locust left left, the canker worm hath eaten that which the canker worm hath left, the caterpillar eaten Four. these are spirits. And he said, Awake, ye drunkards, and weep. And howl, all ye drinkers of wine. Because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Now, this is a curse. God is saying, See this Bible? This is new wine. Which is why... The Bible doesn't make sense to a lost man, but it makes sense to a saved man. Why? Because you put new wine in new bottles. You want to put old wine somewhere, put it in old bottles. That's for the old man, not the new man. New man doesn't want it. The new wine now is cut off from their mouth. I do believe that there will come a time when God, and, and take that now, match it up against what he said in Amos. In Amos, there's going to be a famine, not a famine of bread or of water, but a famine of hearing the words of God. I believe there's coming a time when God is going to shut the Bible off and cut it off to a majority of the people who are in this earth. He's going to cut it off from them. They will no longer have access to the word of God. They'll be cut off from it. God said, I'm going to take it away from you. You know why? Because you had it all your life. You didn't want it. You didn't read it. You turned your back on it. You, you told that preacher that visited you, I don't want to hear your words, preacher. I don't need that Bible preached at me. I don't want anybody preached to me. I had a guy say this to me in his house. I mean, he was... Hot, angry, hot at me. Because I 
was talking to his daughter about baptism. She had been saved. And then I started talking to him about salvation. And he looked me in the eye and he said, let me tell you something, preacher. I know where your church is. And if I ever feel like going to your church and listening to one of your sermons, then I'll get up and I'll come over there and listen to him. But right here in my house, I don't want to hear it. Woo! So you know what I did? I shut up. I prayed with his wife, prayed with his daughter. We told him, I said, we're going to baptize your daughter. And I mean, walked out of there, kicking the dust off my shoes. And I said, that guy will want a preacher for his funeral. There's no doubt in my mind about that. His family would be calling somebody to preach the funeral. But he didn't want to hear it then. And he said, the new wine is cut off from your mouth. Verse 6, and this is going to be in the context of it. A nation has come upon my land. A nation. But it's not going to be the Russians. It's not going to be the Chinese. Russians can be defeated. The Chinese can be defeated. Philistines can be defeated. But this nation that's come upon his land... They don't look like Russians and Chinese people. Russians people, Chinese people, they don't have lion's teeth in their mouth. And that's what it says. Whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. They don't have lion teeth in their mouth. And by the way, what are lion's teeth for? Yeah, ripping if you ever watch, I, uh, I watch Rob the Ranger on YouTube. I like this guy. He, I, he used to be down in South Africa. Now he's moved to Kenya. I think he probably got a better deal up there. But he moved to Kenya and he does safari tours. And he zooms in on these lions eating this big ox. And you hear them crunch, crunch, crunch out of the side of their mouth. They're chewing the skin off. So they can peel that skin back and get to that meat. You're here on crunching bones. Trying to get that marrow out of there. That's the, that's the nation that's coming. A nation that have lion's teeth. A nation unlike we've ever seen before. In verse 4 of chapter 2, a nation that have the appearance of horses. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horse men, so shall they run. So they have the appearance, number one, of lion's teeth. They have te lion's teeth in their mouth. They have the appearance of a horse and a rider. The sound of them is the sound of chariots. On tops of mountains shall they leap. Man by the name of Kenneth Arnold in June of 1947, flying around Mount Rainier, saw nine semicircular discs flying at what seemed to him to be about three to four thousand miles an hour. And he said, it looked like they were just skipping across the air like if you threw a saucer and skipped it across the water. That's what it looked like. And that's where the term flying saucers came. And that's what you're seeing right here. Um, the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall be gather blackness they shall run like mighty men they shall climb the wall like men of war and they shall march every one on his ways and they shall not break their ranks neither shall one thrust another they shall walk every one in his path and when they fall upon the sword they shall not be wounded this army cannot be killed with physical armaments our weapons of warfare are not carnal they shall run to and fro in the city, he said. And they shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up on the houses. They shall enter into the windows like a thief. And he's telling you about an army that's coming. 
that does not look like anything we have ever seen in this earth before, ever. And he says, at that time, the new wine's going to be cut off from your mouth. I'll not let you have access to my word. You won't be able to read it to find out what, what's going on. I'm going to hide it from you. There's going to be a famine of it. Now, in, now in chapter 3 of Joel, verse 18... Let's actually go back to verse 15 to get the context. The sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake. So we have the sun being darkened and the moon being darkened. That's Revelation 2, Joel 2, Acts, uh, Acts chapter 2, Revelation 6. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice, that's Revelation 10, I believe. Utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens of the earth shall shake. That's the opening of the sixth seal, when the heavens and the earth shake. And God shakes the heavens, and angels fall out of it like figs falling out of a tree when you shook it. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Verse 17, so shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion. This, at this point, Israel's going to know who God is. I'm in Joel 3, verse 17. So shall I know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. Verse 18, and it shall come to pass in that day that the mountain shall drop down new wine. Not the old stuff. Why? New wine represents the new covenant. Everything's new. With a new covenant, there's going to be new wine. There's going to be new bottles to put it in. Okay? Everything's going to be new. And the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Siddim. So new wine, God is going to pour out. In fact, Joel, the whole book of Joel is about how God pours out his spirit upon all flesh. And when they did, when that happened in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost, what did they accuse the disciples of? These men are drinking new wine. That's what it said. New wine. Zechariah 9, 17. For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful and new wine the maids. And, and you know what some people do? They corrupt that. Corn. Oh, that means corn liquor. Moonshine. Corn shall make the young men cheerful and new wine, the maids. New wine, not old wine. New wine, not fermented wine. New wine. It's his spirit. It's his word. Matthew 9. And I, I might just go ahead and let you know now that uh, the word bottles here is actually because of the Mandela effect. Huh? Yeah. That was one of the claims that these Mandela effect websites and YouTube videos made was, see the Bible, the Bible now says you neither do, do men put new wine into old bottles well i grew up in a church years ago and they said the word wineskins we know they didn't have bottles back in jesus day so they've changed the bible no they didn't you're an idiot nobody went back in time stepped on a butterfly and changed the bible nobody did it has always said bottles. Now the NIV says wine skins. Okay? 
But the King James has always said bottles. Always. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles. He's talking about the new covenant, the new testament, the new man, the Holy Spirit, and new wine that comes from the cluster. It's not been corrupted with leaven into new bottles and both are preserved. Acts chapter 2. Verse 12, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Because they can hear these men speaking in these languages. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Now they're mocking them. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as ye suppose. Now, Kenneth Hagin took this passage and said, but they were drunken, just not how they thought they got drunk. That's, how he, that's what he did, John. He said they really were drunk. They acted like drunks. They were falling down all over the place. And you couldn't understand a word they said. That's his doctrine. That was his, that was his thing. When Hagin or Rodney Howard Brown would go someplace... That spirit went with, it is a spirit. There's no doubt in my mind it was a devilish, evil, drunken spirit that he would bring to these churches and they would fall underneath the curse of these devils acting like drunk people, claiming that that was the Holy Ghost. Oh, the Holy Ghost make you drunk. Holy Ghost make you fall all over. Why, see this guy laying on top of that, those three women over there? That's not, that's nothing wrong with that. That's the Holy Ghost. No, there's something wrong with that. These men are full of new wine, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice, said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. These are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Pour it out like wine. Pour it out. Pour it out. He's pouring out his spirit. So new wine is a representation of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. That causes you to think rationally and think righteously and not behold strange women and not vomit and fill the table with vomit. Okay? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. That's what new wine does. Um... Let's see here. Where do I want to go from here? Yeah, let's talk. Let's touch on this forbidden wine. Spend a few minutes on this. There is forbidden wine. And I and I don't care. What video you watched on the Internet, I don't care what preacher told you to something else. I don't care what Bible commentary said, something different. I don't care what anybody else says. You will never convince me that just the drinking of alcohol, just just to drink it, number one, is unbiblical. Number two, it's dangerous. And you'll never be able to convince me otherwise. There are people in, there are people who, some, you may be sitting here, you may be watching me right now. You know for a fact the devastating effects that alcohol has in a person's life. Devastating. 
effects. Your daughter was killed by a drunk driver. Your son was killed by a drunk driver. Your mother was killed by a drunk driver. Drunk, dry, drunk men are wife beaters, child beaters, child molesters, rapists, you name it, they'll do it. And it's the alcohol in them. Drugs, same thing. Same, they go into the same category as liquor. They are altering your perception of reality. When you are high on marijuana, they say marijuana is harmless. It is not. You, you have altered your perception of reality. Why do people who are high on marijuana laugh at everything? Not everything's funny. Why do they do that? It is because the marijuana has altered their perception of reality. And it's caused them to think things that are not true, that are not right. Same way with wine. Leviticus 10, 9, do not drink wine nor strong drink. So now the context is, you understand the context. He's not speaking of new wine because he mentions it directly with strong drink. Tequila, vodka, whiskey, scotch, bourbon, rye. What else is there? Sake, whatever else there is. Do not drink wine nor strong drink. Thou art no thy sons with thee when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Number six, three. This is a person who has took a Nazarite vow. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes or eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. If you want to, if you want to defend it, go ahead, defend it. Go ahead and defend it. Well, I you know, drink a little bit to kind of unwind at the end of a long day. I just kind of have to relax a little bit. Okay? This may sound hokey and may sound overly simplistic. But I can tell you that reading your Bible at the end of a long day is far superior than drinking at the end of a long day. Far superior. Far better results out of it. Proverbs 31, verse 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. No, for princes, strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judge. Nancy Pelosi is a vodka drunk. Is, you, you'll never be able to convince me otherwise. She is a vodka drunk. And um, it affects Reg Kelly's family. His father, his brothers, and now his daughter have always been active in Missouri politics. Always. And his dad was in the state legislature. His brothers have been in the state legislature. Now his daughter is in the state. And, I, and Reg told me that his brother tried for years to get a bill passed that prohibited the importation of alcoholic beverages into the Capitol building. Because just about every office in the state capital, Jefferson City, Missouri, had ordered alcohol to have in all of those congressmen's offices. So they, had a, they had a little bar in there. And his family had worked for years to get that stopped. Why? Drunks don't pass good bills. And your Bible's right. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor princes strong drink. 
because they drink and forget the law and pervert judgment. Isaiah 5, 11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink, that they, they can't wait to get up and get that first drink. They continue until night, till wine inflame them. They drink from morning till night. Until wine, look at the word, inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tabernacle and the pipe and the wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Look at what, look at what wine and strong drink will do to your view of God. It will cause you to not regard the work of God or the operation of his hands. Our drunken congressmen, both at the state level and the federal level, do not regard the fact that our nation was birthed under Christianity. They do not regard that. This Bible's right. It is right. Isaiah 5, 22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle drink, strong drink which justify the wicked for reward. What did they just do to Joe Biden? Who we now know has made millions and millions of dollars in backdoor deals with the Ukraine and China. They justified him. They justified the wicked for reward. Because Biden said, get me in president. When I get some more money in, we'll spread it around a little bit. And take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Isaiah 28, 7. They have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there's no place clean. That's the effects of alcohol. That's what it does to you. Dirty houses. Dirty cars. Dirty lives. Isaiah 29, stay yourselves in wonder, cry ye out and cry, they are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. The vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Why can't you read it? Because you're drunk. You can't read and know the Bible because you're drunk multitudes, multitudes of pastors in this country have a drinking problem. Multitudes of them have serious issues with drugs and or alcohol. Multitudes of them. And they're supposed to be the spiritual heads of the flocks. Telling them what's right, telling them what's wrong, telling them the way to eternal life. And all they do is stumble in judgment. They err in vision. They cannot see. Well, I don't see anything wrong with your lifestyle. Why? Because they're drunk. Physically and spiritually as well. So don't ever ask me to change my opinion. Don't ever ask me. Now, Mike, won't you look to the Bible again and maybe see if maybe the Bible might change your mind a little bit about this issue. Because it won't. Bible's very clear on this issue. I have said it before. There are tiny, limited allowances. Uh, if somebody, if you're ever going in for surgery, they apply a mixture of drugs to render you unconscious so you can survive the pain of the surgery. There's zero wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Back in the old days, they get you drunk up so bad you didn't even know which end was up before they cut a guy's arm off. And then they'd pour alcohol on the wound. That was their medicine back then. That's what they had. Okay? And, the, and again, there's limited situations where it is okay if you want to abuse that don't pin that on me but you have something better you have something better than a beer amen 
Uh, let me read some prayer requests. Now it's time we really got to pray for our country. Uh, pray for Lisa and I, Sterling and Gloria. Our country needs God. Rose, thank you for writing it that way. Linda Toomey's out of the hospital. Uh, Jan is recovering. Rose Hinton, Catherine White and her sons. Betty Forsyth has uh, another niece with COVID. David Cherney has been in the hospital. He's having some heart problems. They found he's got a hole in his heart. So pray for him. Jenny's in the last stage of cancer. Dee's sister Darlene. Mike Summer. Betty Walsh's family, David Wood, John Gordon, Holly Farmer, Lori needs prayer. Donna is asking prayer for Tori, Brian and Pam and their family, Donna True Love and family, Chris and his family, Donna Byerly, pray for her, Mike and Karen, Monica, Philip, pray for Philip, Roy and uh, brother Roy and sister Bonnie, lift them up, sister Pam Kettleson and her son and family. Sister Nancy Rindel, Sally, pray for Sally. She got four spots on her lungs. Cubby and Cindy, Max, Noel Marino, Max and Sherry, Gary, Kelly and family, our country, our president, our soldiers, first responders, our church, our online church. We are going to do another feeding. Uh, our widows, our Kenya friends, pray, continue to help us pray about this idea we had for a shipping container to work out of. It's a place to distribute food from, a place to broadcast from. Help us pray about that, all right? Anybody else have any prayer requests? Yes, John. Amen. Okay. 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 Rose. Yeah. And pray for Joe. He's just, he's sick. He's got something going on with his kidneys. And uh, they've got him... Saying he's wait, you got to wait till February for a doctor's appointment, but he may not wait that long. It's pretty serious, so pray for him. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Uh, I'll be headed out Friday morning, headed down to Pea Ridge, Arkansas. Camp meeting down there, going to be preaching Friday night. So pray for me. I'm just struggling, not sure what to preach down there, haven't got it settled yet. So pray for me that God will lead me on what to preach, what to say. It's Brother Jamie Doyle and his family. Brother Ellis, his dad, helps him there as like an assistant pastor. Good family, good friends of ours. I love them dearly. So uh, just pray for, uh, pray for me as I travel down there. And that God will uh, give me a message to preach to him down there. All right. Let's come in and have a word of prayer. Father, we come before you. We're very, very grateful for the days that you've brought us through. Father, we're very concerned for our country. Very concerned. The leadership we have now, Father, we know what they believe. We know what they stand for. But Father, I know what I stand for. I know what I stand against. And I will continue to do so. Father, we know, God, that you ultimately are in power over this nation. You will decide what you will do with us. You will decide, Father, what president we have. You will decide, Father, how this nation turns out. Father, my only prayer for America is revival. A revival, Lord, where 
people in this country realize that communism, globalism, and all of that junk, God, is not the country that you founded here. We pray, dear God, that you would help the people to continue to stand against the evils that have taken over this country. It is worse than Obama. It is worse than Bill Clinton. It's worse than any of them has ever been. And Father, we ask God that you just give us the strength and the ability to continue to stand. And Father, we also know, God, that times like this separates out the real Christians from the fake ones. And Father, what we're asking from you tonight, God, is that you allow us to be on your side. Father, that you've elected us, that you've called us, that you've given us of your grace, Father, that we are, in fact, your people. Separate us out from this godless world that we live in. Father, we ask, dear God, for your grace and all of these prayer requests. Too many, Father, Lord, that I can remember. And I pray, dear God, should bless each and every one of them. Be with all of our widows, be with our ministries, the people that we feed. I pray, dear God, that you would continue to bless that. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you'd give us a permanent place to be able to do that out of. And that, Father, Lord, that somehow, some way, just like the cruises of oil that you filled for the old woman, God, the oil would never run dry. The food bank would never run empty. God, that you would just keep providing and keep blessing and keep using us, Father, for your glory and for those people whom you dearly love. God, I believe that. I know you love those people. You love the people, Lord, that the rest of the world has cast aside. Those are the people you love, like us. The world has cast us aside. And now we come to you, Father. We thank you, God, for not turning us away, but for making us one of your own. Father, I pray, Lord, you'd bless your word tonight. Lord, if there's anybody out there, Lord, that's struggling with alcohol or drugs or any other type of addiction, God, that you would give them healing, that you'd give them help from heaven. I pray, dear God, that your grace would be manifested in their life and their heart. Help them to fight the good fight and win over this thing. We pray, Heavenly Father, God, you dismiss us in your care tonight. Go with us as we travel about. Help us to take Jesus with us everywhere we go. Let our light shine in a very, very dark world during this dark winter. Let our light shine, Father, for your glory and your kingdom's sake. We love you and we trust you in all things. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you.